I'm Sarah, and thank you for joining us for worship today. If you're just joining us, we're going to be doing some announcements before our service, and you're welcome to use the video chat to talk with other people who are watching this live. If you're watching this after the live premiere, you're welcome to use the timestamps to skip ahead to the main service. We hope you enjoy worshiping with us.
Well, good morning to each and every one of you, and uh, thank you for joining us here today. Yes, on this first Sunday of Daylight Saving Time. Anyway, several announcements before we, uh, we lead, I lead you in prayer here this morning, and we go to worship. Uh, announcement number one. There's a youth movie night coming up this week, this Wednesday, March 17th at 6 p.m. Make sure you come, youth. Uh, secondly, as we announce each and every week, if you would like to connect with a pastor this week or if there's a need we can meet, please call our office. The office is open Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., so please call us if there's any need to connect or any need that we can try to help to meet. Anyways, thank you. And finally here today, we have three deacons coming off the board now, and they have served so incredibly well. I believe two of them had two complete terms. So I just want to thank Rick and Dave and Esther, and we're just so grateful for your service. Thank you for loving Summit Drive Church here. Would you now join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come into your very presence because the way into your awesome and holy presence has been made possible by your son's death on the cross. Yes, a death that took care of humanity's sins and yes, our sins once and for all. Oh, Father, we thank you that Christ's once and for all death was totally sufficient to deal with our sins and allow us to come into your presence 24-7. Father, in this unique season where we cannot gather in small or larger ways, help us, encourage us, equip us to do what we must, to love you, to make disciples, to love one another, to pray for one another, to grow deeper in our faith, and yes, to draw ever so close to you. Yes, may we seize the opportunities of this pandemic for your good and holy purposes. Father, continue to work in our hearts that we may have our minds renewed so that we may think our way through life from your perspective. And Father, as promised in the new covenant, write your laws, your values on our hearts so that we'd willingly choose to do what is good and holy and wholesome and profitable for all. And Father, we ask today that you would guide those in charge of our public health measures into all that is profitable and fair. Bless them, Father. And today, Father, we just want to give you thanks for all those in our community who have faced serious illness, even cancer over this last season of life and now who are doing so well. We just thank you for their recoveries. And here today we pray for a member of our community facing surgery this week. Grant them your peace. Grant them your grace. Restore them once again. And Father, we think of a, 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 young, a youngster, a young child by the name of Jackson, that his health would prosper once again. And Father, we pray for all the marriages represented here at Summit Drive, that you would strengthen them one act and one word of encouragement at a time. Father, we think of today a young couple in our church making a big, big decision. Grant them wisdom, Father. Grant them wisdom. May they know that they've made the right decision. Give them unity of decision. And Father, we think of our family of the week. We thank you for Sonia and for Parker and Hunter. May they experience your grace this week. Enable them to see your hand guiding them. And Father, may they respond to you by setting Christ as part as Lord, as Lord of their heart. And we think of those in long-term care, and I just think of Carl and, and Ray and Florence, that they would all experience friendship and kindness and love in the midst of isolation. And Father, for a couple churches, we just want to pray for First Baptist here in Kamloops and a church in Vancouver called Zion. Father, your spirit would come upon these churches and that they would live lives worthy of the gospel. Father, we think of our board of deacons. Grant, grant them unity as they work for the health and the everyday functioning of our community here. 
Father, we think of Green Bay Bible Camp, this great ministry in Kelowna. Grant them favor. Grant them favor in their community that they would experience the goodwill of all their neighbors. And Father, we think of today the church in Nigeria, the persecuted community of believers in Nigeria. Grant them. Grant them strength to endure. And Father, we pray for those kidnappers in Nigeria who are just uh, making so many people afraid. We pray that they would come to faith and they would be transformed to be enhancers of all that is good and protectors of life. And Father, we think of an unreached people, the unreached people of Vietnam, specifically the Hani people, that they would live in fear no more. Lord, that they would have a new worldview rooted in Christ and that they'd be free from superstition. Father, send the good news amongst this people. And now I just invite you for the next minute to pray, to pray for someone who so needs your prayer. Let's all pray together. Father, again, we thank you for this day you've given us for worship. Give us hearts to, hearts to hear as the word is instructed and preached today. And Father, give us eyes to see how you will intervene in all that we've prayed for this day. In Christ's name I pray. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite Andrew now to uh, call us to worship here today. All right. Good morning. You know, if we were to sit together and have a conversation and we asked each other, hey, have you experienced something hard in your life? Most definitely we would both answer each other and say, yeah, we, we have. Almost certainly every person experiences something hard in their life at some point or another. And I have no doubt that in this community alone, Summit Drive, there's a whole encyclopedic worth of experience and hardship and suffering. Yet as followers of Jesus, our only sure response is to look at Jesus resolutely, at the one who suffered so immensely that really no comparison can even suffice. Are you suffering right now? Your answer might be yes. Look to Jesus, the one whom the prophet, prophet Isaiah said had no beauty or majesty to even attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should even desire him. He was despised. Rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. And surely such a God like this, one who resolutely faced Jerusalem, faced the cross, and yes, even faced the momentary abandonment of his own father, surely he's our answer and he's worthy of our adoration today. Jesus knows and, and, and he's with us at all times and in all situations, including yours. Let's adore him now through song and let's give him thanks, even in perhaps our, our weakness that we're experiencing now or heartache or even longing that you might have. Let's worship him together.
sing this nations bow nations bow mountains shake at the sound of just one name over all Jesus reigns I know I know nations bow mountains shake at the sound of just one name over all Jesus reigns I know I know
I'll find life's fine. No war with pain. And then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the light. Psalm 71, verses 14 and 15 say, But I will con hope continually and will praise you yet more and more. My mouth will tell of your righteous acts, of your deeds of salvation all the day, for their number is past my knowledge.
Thanks so much to our, to our worship team and to uh, our tech people as well, whom you can't see, uh, and just their commitment to leading us week in and week out like this. So, so grateful for that. Hey, if you're um, new and just joining us, uh, my name is uh, Dave Fields. I'm our lead pastor here at Summit Drive, and uh, we've been studying through the book of Acts which is written by the author Luke. Now, this is the same Luke that wrote the Gospel of Luke. That's like part one of this story. The, the book of Acts is, is part two. It's like the story of Jesus is being continued on in the power of the Holy Spirit into this next book, which really speaks of the spread of the, uh, of the Christian church and the message of the Gospel. And, um, and really, these are very connected, and we're going to see why a little bit more today. Now, let me just give you a brief sketch of where we've been so that you can pick up in, in the flow of the story. Right at the beginning of Acts, the risen Jesus, like he's just gone through uh, crucifixion, and now he's been raised by the, the, the work of the one true God, and... Um, and he appears to his disciples a number of times over the next 40 days. And in his last appearance, he tells them this. He says, you will be my witnesses. Like, you're going to tell the world about me, starting here in Jerusalem. And then it'll go all the way out to the ends of the earth. So he sends them with this commission. And, and this message, at the heart of the message is this. That the God who made us and loves us is in the process of redeeming and restoring his good world, and everyone who trusts in Jesus within it. That though we had, as humanity, turned away from God and lived on our own terms, God has pursued us in love. That God himself, God the Son, came for us, and he lets his life break apart. He goes through the, the, the deepest of brokenheartedness possible. Why? For us. It's out of love that... Jesus lets his life break so that he can put his world back together again and us within it too. And so that's the message that Jesus sends his followers to bring um, to everyone and they're, they're, they're commissioned now to both preach this news, to, to, to speak about it, but also to embody what it means in our life together as God's people. Now, early on in Acts, we find out that many Jewish folk, they do actually receive this message of Jesus, and the, and the church is born, it starts right there, but actually we find out too that many others do not accept it. They, they, they're scandalized by the idea that Jesus is actually the fulfillment of the whole of the story that we read of in the Hebrew Bible. And so there's this major persecution that breaks out against the early Christian movement, and it starts with the killing of one of the early Christians. His name is Stephen. Now, there's this guy. Uh, Saul is his name. He's part of that mob that has Stephen killed. And he is just burning with zeal to snuff out this Christian movement. And so, he's going door to door, and he's dragging out these Christian people to bring them to court and even to see them put to death. That is, until he's met by the risen Jesus. This encounter radically transformed him from, from an enemy of Jesus to his ambassador. And Jesus sends Paul to bring this news, this good news of Jesus, especially to the non-Jewish world all over the Mediterranean. And so his life is upended, and it's now consumed by this mission. And so for years, you can track, and the book of Acts is tracking how Paul is moving from city to city and he's preaching the message of Jesus, and there's new churches that are starting, and it's, it's this amazing thing that God is doing through his ministry. But the other thing that he's doing is this. He's actually collecting money, not for himself, but to take back with him from these Gentile, primarily Gentile churches, to the Jewish church back in Jerusalem, who are now suffering under famine conditions and great persecution. He wants to bring them something to, to ease their suffering and to, to be a signal of, of, of his love. And so, it, it's the Holy Spirit who's leading him back to Jerusalem. But here's the problem, is that the Jewish leadership there in Jerusalem, they want him dead. And so, Paul's, uh, Paul's friends, we see them back in Acts 20 and 21, they're warning him. They say, don't go, Paul. There's disaster awaiting you. And Paul says, I know there is, but this is what Jesus is calling me into. 
And we might just think, well, what, can't they send someone else with this gift? Why Paul? Here's why. The Spirit is leading him, but this is also personal for Paul. You see, he's delighted to be able to bring this gift from a Gentile church to a Jewish church to, to show that the new creation, where what God is doing in bringing these, these people who've been divided uh, over these sort of racial and ethnic lines back together as the one people of God under the gracious reign of Jesus. So to bring this gift is to signal that they are one church in Christ. But the other thing is this. It's the church in Jerusalem that Paul was persecuting. He was killing folks there. And now he wants to come with a gift. He wants to come and serve this church that he once tried to tear apart. And more still, Jesus, his, his king, the one who's commissioned him, this is the place, Jerusalem, where Jesus suffered and died for him. And Paul would find it no greater honor than to suffer as well in that same place alongside his king. You see, Paul is learning to read his story in light of Jesus' own story. Not only of his resurrection, yes, there's that part too, but even of his death. And he's coming to see his own suffering as a key part in his witness to Jesus. And now I know, as we hear that, that might just leave our heads spinning. Like we could hardly fathom the idea that someone would walk toward suffering. It catches us off guard. It sounds wrong in our ears. Why would he do that? Again, Paul is learning to use his suffering to serve the gospel. And as readers of this text, we are actually being taught to do the same. Let's pray as we begin today. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are at work in our world, that you are making all things new. But Lord, there's a process, there's a time before you come again, Jesus, where we are in the trenches and there will be pain. And so we pray, Father, that as we hear the story of Paul, that we would catch a glimpse of what it means for us too to read our suffering in light of your death and resurrection, Jesus. So help us today by your Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, so last week, um, Pastor Colton was preaching, and we saw that Paul had been carried along by God through the chaos of these trials. I mean, he's been brought before uh, kings and governors, but he's ultimately vindicated. Listen to how the trials are concluded in Acts 26, verse 31. If you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to open up to that chapter. Uh, this is Acts 26, 31. It says this, This man is not doing anything that deserves death or imprisonment, Agrippa said to Festus. This man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Now, scholar William Larkin, he, uh, he says this of, of that section. He says, these declarations of innocence make it clear that Paul and Christianity could not be charged with sedition against the state. Nothing in the conduct of the messengers called the truthfulness, value, and benefit of this message into question. See, the early church was very careful that they did not ruin their witness to the rest of the world around them or bring the credibility of the gospel into question, even if it cost them their comfort or their ease. Man, that point alone is worth us considering in our current moment. Like, how do we maintain a faithful witness in our city at a time like this when, when many people feel, well, it looks like there's unfairness even toward religious communities like ours in terms of health regulations. How do we maintain then this kind of faithful witness to Jesus? And so Paul, he is viewed as a lawful person in this encounter because he is. With the state powers, he is doing everything he can to protect the credibility of the gospel. And he's even being sent to Rome now. Now, one of the, the reasons that Luke takes so much time to record these trials and, and the shipwreck is at, that we're going to see in a moment um, is to show that God is faithful and sovereign. And he is leading through it all. Like, he can be trusted. God is accomplishing his plans 
despite the fact that this all looks a bit like a, a disaster for Paul. Here's how scholar David Peterson summarizes Paul's experience in Acts 21 to 28, like the whole last chunk of the book. He says it, he says it well. As Paul endures suffering, he learns to use it to serve the gospel. Seen in this way, Acts gives the reader a theology of suffering that is particularly exemplified in the life and work of the apostle. See, Luke tells the story of Paul as an echo, actually, as, as a reflection of the end of his other story, the Jesus story. Think of it. Jesus is brought on trial. He's shown to be innocent, yet he faces unjust suffering, and he entrusts himself to God through it all. So let's now see how this particular scene unfolds. We're going to pick up at Acts 27, verse 1. It says this, when it was decided that we would sail for Italy, Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius, who belonged to the imperial regiment. Now, now just notice, Luke himself, it says we, Luke himself was a part of this journey. He was an eyewitness to all that happens. And, and the other prisoners, we just have to pause over that for a second. These folks are likely condemned to death already. And they're being shipped to Rome, well, because of the near insatiable appetite for entertainment, to have people fed to the lions or, or locked into mortal combat for the entertainment of the masses. They were being treated not as humans, but as objects, as dispensable in this moment. Let's pick up now in verse 8. We moved along the coast with difficulty and ca came to a place called Fair Havens near the town of Lassay. Much time had been lost and sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was after the Day of Atonement. So Paul warned them, men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our lives also. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and the owner of the ship. Now, scholars have, have noted that Paul, in his travels and his missionary journeys, probably spent somewhere in the neighborhood of 5,000 kilometers on the seas in a boat. That means he is almost certainly the most experienced person in the boat, maybe even by far. So Paul is speaking very practically at this point. He offers his wisdom from his experience, which is passed over, much to the detriment of everyone. Now let's keep reading. Verse 13. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they saw their opportunity, so they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Nor'easter swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind, so we gave way to it and were driven along. So this storm, it has the ship in its grip now. The crew is doing everything that they know how to to keep from it being broken apart and certain death. Now verse 18. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor star appeared for many days, and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. This includes, we, includes Paul and Luke as well. They were basically looking at the raging sea saying, we're going we're gonna to die in that sea. Who knows when, but probably soon. Verse 21. After they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourself this damage and loss, which sort of sounds like, hey guys, I told you so. But we shouldn't read it that way. Paul isn't trying to score points here. What he's doing is establishing the reason why they need to listen to him now in what he's about to say, even though he's speaking much more on the plane of the theological and the prophetic. Let's see what he says in verse 22. But now I urge you, Keep up your courage, because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the God to whom I belong, I love that phrase, and whom I serve stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. 
You must stand trial before Caesar, and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. What's Paul's basis for this encouragement to the men that he's with there? He believes in the character, like the faithfulness, and he believes in the word of his God. He knew that God is the one who keeps his promises. And more, Paul shows us something of what it looks like to engage our world with both reason and faith combined. And this is really our first take-home point. You see, Paul initially draws on his common sense and experience about the seas when he warns them against the sailing initially. Next, he shares this experience of the angelic visitor and the prophetic word that he has. And in a moment, we'll see that he actually breaks bread and and prays publicly with people who definitely don't share his faith in Jesus at this point. Here's what we need to see. Paul integrates reason and experience in faith And he brings it all together. We live in an age where uh, faith and reason are often pitted against each other. But Paul certainly doesn't do that. Here's what John Stott says in his commentary. Paul combines spirituality with sanity and faith with works. He believed that God would keep his promises and had the courage to say grace in the presence of a crowd of hard-bitten pagans. He was a man of God and a man of action, a man of the Spirit, and of common sense. And I think this touches down for us in whatever our work, we can pray and trust God with, uh, with the, the, the work that we're doing. But more, we can think about it. We bring both our faith and our experience and our education to bear on the things God has called us to do. That's why we can give praise for faithful scientists and healthcare practitioners who've worked hard using their God-given talents in the lab or, or in the clinic this past year. Because all truth is God's truth, it means we can say praise be to God whenever things that are good for human flourishing and good for God's creation are developed. And so maybe you're listening and, and you felt like you've had to choose one or the other, either faith or reason. E- you know, use your brain or, or trust God, like those are two separate options. Good news, you don't have to pick. God gives us these brains and then expects us to use them wisely and for His glory and for the good of the world, even as we pray and expect God to do the miraculous in response to it. So, question, are there ways that maybe you've been ignoring one to the exclusion of the other? Maybe you've been pitting faith against reason in some way or felt that this was a tension. Paul shows us a better way here. So work and pray, think and believe and bring it all together, just as Paul does in this text. Now, let's jump down to verse 33. Just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you've been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food. You will need it to survive. There's the practicality again, isn't there? Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. That's the believing in the divine promise. After he said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of them all. He broke it and began to eat. They were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. Altogether, there were 276 of us on board. When they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. Now to verse 41. The ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow struck first and would not move, and the stern was broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf. The soldiers planned to kill the the prisoners to prevent them from swimming away and escaping, but the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered that those who could swim jump overboard first and get to land. The rest were to get on planks or on other pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reached land safely. Here's our second take-home. Paul's response is from a place of public truth for the public good. See, I love the fact that Paul prays. 
He gives thanks to God as he encourages the passengers and crew to eat. You know, one of the challenges we face in our, in our moment today is this underlying assumption that, that like, you know, faith, that's a private thing. That, that, that doesn't belong in the public sphere. But listen to how Alan Noble talks about this. And he actually uses the example of, well, saying table grace in public. Here's what he writes. Our society's broad assumption is that religious exercise belongs in our hearts or in our homes or in our churches. It doesn't belong in the booth at McDonald's. Public displays of religion are more offensive than public displays of affection. For many Americans, seeing someone practicing religion in public feels a little bit like watching the inebriated in public. Like, what are they going to do next? Like, why aren't they being rational? Why couldn't they just keep this to themselves? And that's what I love about Paul's approach here. He's not weird about his faith, but he's not private about it either. He breaks bread. He gives thanks to God among people who don't share his faith. And now here's where this really maybe touches down for us. Noble continues, saying grace in public can be a testament to the watching world that our faith is not just a personal preference that we keep discreetly hidden behind our quote-unquote normal public life. And insofar as saying grace defies the secular social etiquette of privatizing religious practices, it is a disruptive witness. Let me translate that simply. It's to say this. So yeah, say grace in a restaurant, in public, or reading your Bible in the lunchroom, or simply being known as a Christian, as a believer in your workplace. These are small acts but they can actually function as a, as a legitimate disruptive witness to what is status quo in our world. They point to the fact that Christianity is public truth. See, Christianity is not just a philosophy. It's not just kind of like a way of life that you can practice if you kind of feel like it. No, Christianity makes historic claims. Like, it can't just be true for me and not true for you because if Jesus really is God the Son who died and was raised again for the sins of humanity and to bring forgiveness and new life, man, that is not just true for me or just us in our little circle. That is universally applicable. That's universal in scope. It's for everyone. Notice, too, the way Paul lived his public faith was in seeking the good of those on the ship with him. He builds the trust of the public official could it be that Paul's bold, loving service to the rest of the passengers led the centurion to say, no, I don't want anybody to be killed. I, don't, I want Paul to be protected. And so he saves the lives of all the other prisoners too. You see, when God's people act in line with God's hospitable character for the public good, we actually reflect God's own graciousness. This is one of the reasons why in our current moment, uh, the pressure that the pandemic has caused, and it really has, it's caused real suffering in a lot of ways. We're losing things that we're used to having, for sure. But in the midst of that pressure, we as a church are seeking to live in a way that's consistent with this, to seek the public good, to say, how can we serve our broader city? How can we give to those in need at this time? That's what we're seeking to do as well. But here's the part that makes it particularly challenging. See, it's, it's particularly evident where our faith rests in how we handle the challenges and the suffering. For notice, next, this is part three, Paul doesn't deepen the suffering for himself or others. It's, we've seen that Paul isn't spared from the legitimate suffering of this disaster. But second, he doesn't suffer more than he needs to either nor does he cause the suffering of others. Here's what I mean by this. Um, some of you are ill-prepared for suffering. But you will suffer. That's a guarantee. We suffer because we live in a fallen, broken world, and things are not as they should be, or one day will be. We suffer because we make bad choices that actually cause our suffering or deepen it. We suffer because others make choices that hurt us, and we suffer because following Jesus means that we actually have an enemy of our souls 
God's enemy, and that will make things difficult at times too. What we need to see from Paul is that he is not surprised by the fact of the suffering he's going through. I mean, he's just been locked up in prison for two years. I don't know if you noticed that in the last two chapters, but that's where he's been. He doesn't, I I didn't read a single word of complaint from him. There's no noise made about it. He is able to suffer unjustly, but it's not about bringing everything back to himself. He doesn't think that if he follows Jesus faithfully, somehow he'll be spared from the hurt. Not at all. And he wouldn't understand why we think that's true. See, that's the problem I often encounter as I chat with people, as I minister to people. They're suffering legitimately, but then they add to their own suffering too. And, and that often goes like this. It, it starts by kind of wrongly assuming, like, this shouldn't be happening. There's a sense of surprise there. Uh, like, did I do something wrong and now God is, is punishing me? Does he hate me? I thought if I did things right, my life would be easier, but it's not. Now, there's this word called triumphalism. It, it's a view that's often passed off within Christianity, and it says, like, we win by winning, not by humbly serving. Triumphalism wants the crown, but it doesn't want the thorns that are part and parcel of life with God. It wants the resurrection victory, but it doesn't want to go through death to get there. It wants blessing, but fails to understand the true nature of God's blessing. For blessing doesn't mean ease. It doesn't mean lack of pain. It means God's approval. Like knowing His presence with us even when it hurts. In this section, Paul is completely unsurprised and apparently not even angered by his suffering. But some of you are ill-prepared for suffering. I hope and pray that you can see that when you hurt, it's not because God isn't good, but because at times it's inevitable. God is bringing a world without tears. That's his promise to us. But we're not there yet, folks. One day it will be reality, but it's not now. My prayer is that we would not add unnecessarily to our suffering or to the suffering of those around us. And that can happen in a number of ways. Like, too often our response to suffering is actually to push people away who are trying to love us. And so we isolate ourselves. Or we turn to maybe patterns of numbing rather than addressing it. And that can lead to addictive and destructive ways of life. Or we seek to control situations. Like, feel out of control, we grab those, we grab those handles even tighter, and people around us get hurt as a result. Just one point I want to make here, sort of as a, as a way through for us. Um, this last week, uh, we were at Kamloops Lake uh, on the beach at Tronquil. It was a beautiful day. Uh, Connor and I were fishing, and, and Adam went with uh, Catherine up the hill, and he was, he was hiking around up on the rocks kind of behind when he slipped, and he tumbled into a huge patch of cactuses. He had clumps and clumps down his arms, down his side. They were pushing into his hand, and he had to push himself up, and his hands were just covered in cactuses because he pushed himself up in cactuses. We tried to pick them up, but there were, there were hundreds and hundreds of them all down his body. So we ended up going to emerge. And here's the point of telling you all this. As we drove home from the, from the hospital, Adam said, but it could have been so much worse. Now, why would he say that? We said it because it's true. It, he didn't get it in his eye or in his face. It could have been so much worse. But here's why it's worth repeating. Because it's true for you too. That the suffering that you're going through could have been worse. And now I'm not trying to paint a silver lining around it and say, it's all going to be okay, no big deal. No, your pain is legitimate. What I'm trying to say is this. We don't even know the depths of God's graciousness to us. We don't know what He spared us from in terms of pain upon pain upon pain. More than that, we can actually find reason to worship while in the storm. To say, thank you, God, like Paul was doing in the bottom of this boat. I mean, in Acts 16, we saw Paul and Silas. They had been, what the text reads, severely beaten. Now they're sitting in jail, unsure of what their future is going to be. And what do they do? They begin singing songs of praise to God. 
And here Paul is giving thanks for what I could probably most likely guess is moldy bread right before a shipwreck into the ocean. Is, is he faking it? No, he's legitimately giving thanks to God for his provision even there. Why? Because he knows that God is still more loving and more kind than we could ever dream, even when we're going through the hurt. So may God give you and I the grace to see his goodness and turn it back to him in praise again. And that leads us to our, our, our final point today, point four here, is that Paul sees his suffering as serving the gospel. Now, just as Paul is following the example of Jesus, he's learning to see how his suffering actually serves to, to advance the, the good news of Jesus going forward. We are meant to follow that example too. We've seen that suffering is part and parcel of life. It's going to happen, but more. Here's what we need to see. How we respond to that suffering can serve the gospel, as Paul is showing us here. So now Jesus himself, back in Luke's gospel, he says that anyone who wants to follow him, here's what he says to us. He says, whoever wants to be my disciple, like my follower, they must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. For whoever tries to save their life, man, they're going to lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. Now, there, there's something Jesus says about life on our own terms. Life with me and my agenda at the center. Jesus tells us that has to die if we're actually going to be faithful to following his way. Now, in this section, we see that Paul has internalized that idea and now he's living it out. That's why Paul will tell the Philippian church what he writes to them. In Philippians 1.29, he says this, for it has been granted to you not only to believe in him, to believe in Jesus, but also to suffer for him. So Paul is saying that this is a part of the deal, folks. Following Jesus means that joy and pain, they actually get brought together as part of our witness to the world. Like how we suffer shows who we're trusting in and points others to him as well. Man, I had a great conversation with a friend this past week uh, who just told me about a, a situation that he's facing that's really challenging, a, a conflicted situation at his workplace. And then he shared ex an experience with me that he had uh, during a meeting with a bunch of coworkers where this one coworker was like just cutting him off kind of mid-sentence and actually cutting him down all throughout the meeting. Now, this guy is easy to get along with. He gets along with everybody, basically. But this was a strange situation. The words of this coworker, he said it felt like, like there was this knife that was just cutting at him from different angles, likely coming out of this person's deep insecurities themselves. He found himself leaving the meeting with a real sense of pain and deeply challenged, like he wanted to vindicate himself, to defend himself. And, and so he took a walk, he said, and he just went and he walked and he talked about it with Jesus right after the meeting. Now, folks, that is a mature Christian response to suffering. Do that kind of thing. But as he was walking and praying, he was reminded that Jesus himself was wounded, that he too bore the scars of the wounds that were inflicted on him by others. So he wasn't alone. Jesus knows what he was going through. And so we reflected a little bit more on, on that situation and on the words of Jesus, uh, uh, those words we just looked at. Like, what does it mean to pick up your cross daily and follow Jesus? Now, I, I shared one of the things that I found really encouraging and helpful to me. It comes from the writings of Dietrich Bonhoeffer um, in his book, um, The Cost of Discipleship. And he basically, he asked the question like, okay, so if we're going to bear our cross, what is Jesus doing when he bears a cross? What's he doing? Well, he's bearing the sins of others in his own body. Why? To make his enemies into his friends. To forgive them so that he might embrace them forever. And that's the same for us. To take up our cross daily is dying to our pride or that ego that says, yeah, but they hurt me, and so I'm going to hurt them back. Or that nurses a grudge or that's unwilling to forgive and let them go. Something has to die. That's the cross part. 
we are putting to death the need to justify or vindicate ourselves, to keep ourselves and pride at the center. But when we do allow that pride or that ego to die, when we pick up our cross, we're actually experiencing real freedom, a freedom that comes from our security in Christ. It enables us, knowing that that Christ has embraced us through his own suffering, that enables us to do the same for others. Bonhoeffer says it like this, whoever enters discipleship enters Jesus' death and puts his or her his or her own life to death. I mean, that's what, that's what our baptism signals. When we get baptized, the going under the water is this powerful image of how we are dying and being buried in a grave. Like that old life, that old me, is, is, is meant to be pictured as dying. I'm, I'm no longer my own And then the coming up out of the water is to picture uh, that Christ is in me and given me new life to live in His way. And and think of it, my friend is known in his workplace as a committed follower of Jesus. And so his response in this situation of his dying to a desire to retaliate or justify himself, that will speak volumes to the truth of what Jesus has done for him. Because in Christ, he has a profound sense of security. He doesn't have to justify himself or vindicate himself or defend himself. No, he can just rest in the loving care of God. Now, to be clear, that doesn't mean that we condone abuse or harassment as though it were anything but evil. And that's not to say that there's no accountability in our world. Not that at all. What I mean is this. To be blessed doesn't mean that we don't experience the challenge and the pain. And I don't think Paul had any desire to be shipped around the world or experience shipwreck. The blessing of God is His presence with us and in us, even in all the mess. And He's freeing us to live like He does. Now, just think of Paul, uh, where he breaks the bread in the middle of this messy scene. Although Paul is not hosting Christian communion here, you probably have picked up, this is a real echo of what Jesus does on the night uh, that he sits down at the Last Supper. He's got his, his followers around the table, and that includes Judas, the one who in hours from that moment will betray Jesus to his death. So Jesus takes this bread, and he, and he breaks it, and he gives thanks, and he passes it out, even to Judas. And to you. And to me. Though in a thousand ways I've betrayed him too. Jesus lets his life break to welcome you and I back as his friends. That's why we can do the same for others now. You know, much of our suffering does come from our interpersonal um, relationships. And Jesus, he shows us what to do with that. Jesus says, bless those who curse you. He says, love your enemies. That means seeking the good of those who want to harm us. How backwards is that to the natural bent of my heart? And my friend, in his storm, in what really does feel like in many ways a shipwreck in his current experience, this is a place where he too, like Paul, can extend that hospitality, can break bread and give thanks and hand it out and serve his co-worker. He's setting the table for good things to happen It's in praying for and seeking the good of those who even treat us as enemies in a way. This is what we are called to. When we let this good news that we've already been embraced by God through the suffering of Jesus, when that grabs hold of us, we can treat those who treat us as enemy as friend. We can allow our suffering to serve the gospel too. Because we know that nothing Nothing we do or that's done to us goes unnoticed by God. And that's why we can live out the words that Paul says to the church in Rome. He says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. When God's people live like that, a cross-shaped life, one that is also broken apart at times, that suffers like Jesus suffered for us. When God's people live like that, the beauty of God can shine through. That's faithful witness, even in the mess. I invite the worship team to come, and let's just pray as they do. God, we give you thanks 
that you don't paper over the reality of our pain. You give us through the Scriptures, through examples like Paul, a proper view of suffering and how you're even using it to transform us and to make you known. So help us, Holy Spirit, to read our story from this perspective too. To let our suffering be redemptive, that it might bring you glory and joy to those around us and our own hearts as well. Amen. We will feast in the house of Zion. We will sing with our hearts restored. He has done great things. We will say together, we will feast and weep no So how does Paul keep his head in all of this mess? Here's how. Because he's got his eyes focused on the God who is sovereign over all creation and over his life. Here's what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He says this, therefore we do not lose heart. And I pray that that would be true for you as well. Though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed every day. For our light and momentary troubles 
are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs all of the suffering that we'll face here and now. That's what he's saying. So we fix our eyes, not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporal, but what is unseen is eternal. Let's keep our eyes fixed on our eternal God who loves us. He really does, even in the suffering. And might we see that even our suffering can be redemptive and used for God's redemptive purposes. So be open. Be wide open, folks. Even in this challenging time for us right now, that God would use whatever you're going through to make his glory known. Amen. Because he lives.